Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, it's uh, great to be back at Game Lab. I, I wish I were actually in Barcelona this year, but uh, I guess uh, things being the way they are, this is the best we're going to be able to do. Ken, it's marvelous to meet you, finally. It's nice to meet you, Mark. I, I know I, a lot about you, but we've never met face to face before. Yeah. I am such a huge fan. And I guess, um, why don't we just jump into it? I mean, today's conversation is about uh, creativity in games and the role of uh, the creative director. But let's start uh, maybe an easier place, which is how did you get into games? Uh, so when I was in college, I used to write. I was a writer. and. Um, actually met a, a, a relatively, relatively well-known, he wasn't a TV writer at the point, he was a playwright. And he read some of my stuff and he liked it. And I said, you know, I was young and hungry and I'm like, well, how do I make money doing this? And um, cause I wanted, you know, I was pretty broke. And he sent it to, he said, well, I'll send it to my agent. And he sent it to my, his agent. Long story short, I ended up writing a movie for Hollywood. And then I ended up sort of flaming out spectacularly, spectacularly in that career cut to like several years later of various odd jobs working, you know, retail and banks and all this other stuff. And I saw an ad in a magazine. You remember Next Gen magazine? I do. Yeah. For a job at Looking Glass as a game designer. And I'm like, I was turning 30 and I was like, I'm not doing, I don't, this is going to be my life. You know, I didn't, I wasn't happy with what I had and I gave it a shot and I applied and they flew me out there and like two weeks later, I was a game designer. I mean, did, did a, you have a different a time. background in games beyond having been a screenwriter? I mean, I, I, I've been playing games. You know, I started playing games back in when they were sort of 2D, you know, like hex games, like Avalon Hill board games, which you might remember um, back in the day, these old war yeah, games. Yeah, I, I was a subscriber to Strategy and Tactics magazine, if you want yeah. a blast from the past. Blast from the past. So is that the one that came with a game in every issue? A small game, yes, small in every game. issue, yes. And then, you know, the old electromechanical games, you know, before there were video games, you know, like all those, you know, the baseball game where the metal ball would come out and you hit the bat, you hit the button and the bat hits it out to a hole in the thing, like, like, like glorified pinball. And then, you know, then Pac-Man and Space Invaders and Asteroids. And I just got hooked. I was just hooked. And I never really even realized, Mark, you were in the industry far, below I, far before I was. I never realized like people made the games. I never really thought about it. And then I did, I realized I'm like, oh, I love games. I like that. And I thought, I think I got the job because this is back when they're doing all that full motion video stuff in the nineties. And I think they thought I had some kind of Hollywood connection and I didn't, you know, I <laughs> sort of didn't do very well in the Hollywood field. And um, so they hired me and I just sort of, you know, I got in a room with this guy, Doug Church who was a genius who did the system shock and underworld games. And he sort of took me under his wing and I learned the hard way, you know, of just failing, 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 failing. And Doug, Doug wouldn't would make anything until he thought it was right. So we would, you know, the, the game that eventually became thief was like six other games before it was thief. And Doug kept saying, no, 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 no. And I learned, I learned the value of failure under Doug that, you know, that you learn every, that you take away lessons from those failures and eventually, you know, we turn to thief. Also the value of keeping your game design documents short, right? Because you're going to bin most of them. Yeah. I think that's a common misconception that people think you sit down on the first day and you write a game design document and people say like, Oh, when did, you know, what changed from your original conception? And basically the answer is always, well, everything. Cause the first few days you're just, you're just putting out a bunch of ideas and, and you know, man, they're going to get, they're going to get knocked aside because you're going to come up with better ideas and you're going to try things out that sound great. And, you know, you put them, you put them in the game and it turns out they're not so great. So you got to be open to that. But um, Doug taught me that. And, you know, then after that, I started a, a rational with a couple of other guys and um, did system shock too. And sort of, you know, that, that sort of was the, the, the beginning of what my current trajectory is. So um, I guess, what was your path to becoming a creative director? It was I guess technically you're not quite a creative director, even though you direct creatively. 
I, I, yeah, I mean, the creative director title is sort of like, we don't really, it's not like movies where there's a, there's like unions with specific titles and things like that. I didn't even have the title creative director on System Shock 2 because there was no notion of it. Like there, that title didn't really exist. Um, and maybe a better title shift director, right? You know, because we're very, what we do as a creative director is very similar to film. I think the job is uh, to be the person who understands what the game is and the person who's making sure everybody else has a shared vision of what the game is. And that's really hard because you can work on a big project. I'm sure you've had this experience where you have, you know, a couple hundred people and you've got, you're making 50 different games, you know, because you haven't aligned the vision of everybody on the team um, to the same thing and your vision's changing all the time and then you have to communicate it out. So I think that's one of the hardest jobs of creative director is just making sure everybody's moving in the same direction. But the way I became one is, um, you know, we started the company and we all sort of said, well, you know, the three of us, you know, John Shea and Rob Furby and myself said, well, what do you want to do? And John said, I want to, you know, produce it and be the, a programmer. And Rob's like, I want to be the lead programmer. I'm like, well, I guess I'll do the writing and the design and the aesthetic stuff. Um, and that's why I became the creative director. I sort of made myself creative director because there's nobody to say, hey, you're not qualified to be creative director. Uh, so I just threw myself in the job. So a lot of companies, there's a split, right? There's a, a creative director and a game director because the work is just so overwhelming. And uh, I guess the creative director in those cases is looking at narrative, is looking at world building. Uh, game director is looking at the nuts and bolts of the gameplay. Uh, so you've, you've found a way to essentially do both roles simultaneously or have you, have you split out gameplay um, into its own responsibility? I would say I'm, um, I'm very devolved on the narrative and world building side down to an extremely low level. And on the design side, I've sort of, like I wrote the original design document for System Shock 2. That was the last time I wrote a full design document. And now I sort of work with the designers to come up with what the design is. And sometimes I'll start, I'll come in with a lot of big principles of what I want it to be, some pillars. And, um, and then I'll work with them. But the they're the ones in the editor you know doing and that's where all the magic happens right it's really sitting in the editor and you know tuning vision cones and all that other stuff um and so i tend not to spend as much time in that but on the writing side i'm actually sitting there writing the actual words going into the recording booth with the actors directing them um so it's a bit of a split but i'm i'm sort of have to have my hand in in every in everything because again somebody's got to keep the you know, make sure we're all making the same thing because um, keeping the story and the narrative um, working in parallel with the game design is, I think it's really critical to making the kind of games we do because if those sort of like are orthogonal things, you know, where you just have, well, we got, I want this story. Well, I want this game design and you've got this whole story of like romance and, and love and betrayal, but then you've got, you know, um, you know, breakout on the other side. Um, you know, those things may not match up. Now, there's a way you can find a way to make that match up, but that's the Rob the Credit Director is how do you make those two elements sort of enhance and reinforce each other? Yeah, I think I think the model is not to make break out with really good cutscenes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, you 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 want a unity. Um, so you can create a world where breakout makes sense. Um, that's absolutely possible. It's just you have to make sure that you're unifying it to the other elements of gameplay so you know beyond keeping everybody going in the in the same direction what are the challenges there um well the first challenge is just knowing what you want right it's it's and then i think to be good you also have to know what you want and you also have to know when you've made some when you've made mistakes you have to know that sometimes there are these things you just fall you know the expression kill your babies right you have to kill your babies um not a literal expression not like not a bioshock reference but uh a, a, a it's a it's you have to the things you most fall in love with as a creator sometimes are the things that maybe you should most strongly think about changing or cutting because this emotion you have for them blinds you from seeing how they're really playing out you know and the best way to see how it's playing out is put the game in front of people you know, don't tell them what it should be. Don't tell them what you're thinking. Put it in front of them. 
in the same way that a gamer would be in front of it. And this, you know, this goes from full scale user testing to just going to your 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 colleague in the next room and saying, so what 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 do you think this is? And because you think it's, oh, I think it's telling this particular story and I think they're going to completely get it. And then you watch them like stumble over it and fall over it. And you want to get mad and be like, oh, I don't know, you idiot, you don't know what you're doing, but that's the last thing you should do. So you got to use the people around you to help you understand whether you're hitting the targets you think you are. And sometimes you get stuck in an idea, Mark, and you realize, well, it's just better if I just change this and cut this because I've been trying to make it work. And maybe there's, I'm just, I'm just now tunnel visioned into this thing. And so you got to break out of that tunnel sometimes. And I do that by running usually. So a lot of my creative work is done. I, I'm a runner it is running. It's not done sitting in front of a desk. Like my writing is all done in front of a desk and meetings are all done in front of a desk, but I go for these runs. And a lot of times I say like, pretend X, Y, and Z for my game don't exist, right? It's these big features that have been around forever. What, what, what would happen? What could I do better than that? What can I do different than that? And you really have to work hard to knock those underpinnings out from under you because you just they just become part of your reality. So it's interesting that you're talking about sort of battle testing your concepts or seeing whether or not they're being communicated properly. But I don't know, I look out there and to me, being a creative director to some degree it helps if you're a little bit crazy because you, boy, that isn't coming out right. But you know, you, you have this vision and the point is that vision needs to be really, really interesting and different on some level and memorable, right? Something that will take the players to a place where they've never gone before. Uh, you know, I have this vision, I don't know if it's true or not, but for the Wolfenstein reboot that happened a couple of years ago, I just loved it. I have this vision, the creative director put his boots up on the desk and said to the team, two words, Nazi, robot, dogs. Uh, I know that's three words, but that's kind of the point is you, you set up that, that target and everybody's kind of shaking their heads and wondering what it is. And it's the fact that it's kind of difficult to communicate that makes it special. So, I mean, is any of that ringing true to how you feel about the process of creating a game? Because you were talking mostly about editing and changing, not about that thing. Well, I think there's two parts of the things you're saying. I'm going to break them down. One is, one is this sort of, you know, this vision of this thing that by definition almost wants to sound impossible or really crazy or stupid, right? But I want to talk about this notion of the state of creation. So when I start getting into creative state, um, it can actually end up getting turning myself into a very high state of anxiety because I kind of have to rev the engine up and I have a problems with anxiety in general. But in order to really get creative, I start revving the engine up and I'll be on this run and I'll be having all these really obsessive thoughts because I have to think about, you know, to be obsessive, try to put yourself into the world of the game because you can hold yourself back at a remove, but I get the engine going, boom, 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 boom. And I realize I'm also super anxious by the time I get into the stage, but I need to get into that stage so I can come up with ideas that are different and that will sound counterintuitive. Like the only way I can come up with really counterintuitive ideas is by really ramp, revving myself up. And so sometimes I actually have to step back and say like, Okay, you need to cool the jets for a while because you're gonna. It's gonna lead to other things. You're gonna start getting cranky, and you're gonna start getting, you know, um, you know, difficult and and annoying to the people around you. So I've learned that, but I think that sometimes when you get yourself into this state, I think that if look, a lot of art is made by people who are strange, right? It's it's that's because people want. Like you don't come up with amazing new things that nobody's ever said before by being completely normal. You do it by being a little bit off, a little bit strange. Now I'm, I'm just, I'm just speaking for myself here. I mean, I'm guessing there's. I've talked to a lot of other artists who sort of shared the same experience. Maybe it's not everybody. Maybe there's some people who can be like taking, you know, being you know, totally great and totally normal. But it it makes me strange because I have to go to strange places. And then sometimes I come back and I'll call up like our art director, Sean Roberts, and I'll say, Sean, 
you know what we really need in this game? And, well, I can't really talk about the new game, but there's some weird shit in that, <laughs> that game. And he'll, first I can tell he's like, <sighs> and because it sounds so out there, but Sean's great. And so he'll work with me and he'll try to turn to something that's doable. But I think that if you don't have people at least saying like, that sounds a little insane, you haven't gone close enough to the edge because because the great stuff exists on the edge of over the top right and just okay so sometimes you got to push past the point and make something outrageous and ridiculous and then pull it back but if you don't go to the outrageous and ridiculous you never know where that boundary is we never know where the border is so you've got to sometimes go past it and that means you got to go in the office sometimes and tell people things and they're going to look at you like you're insane and then you sort of bring it back to something that you can actually accomplish yeah I guess outrageous works. Bold works too. I mean, I can I can only imagine Corey Barlog coming in and telling the team, you know what? Next God of War is going to be a story about a father and a son. It's like what? Right. I mean, you know, God of War. That's that's Kratos ripping the hands off. Goes, yes, but this time it's going to be about a father and a son, and it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Uh, and getting I don't know getting getting extreme, getting bold is difficult. Now personally. Um, I know, uh, and I've tried being a creative director. It's tough. Uh, what I do, and this is not not good as a creative director, is I immediately start thinking like a producer, which I'm much better at. You know, it, it, I'll have an idea, uh, and then it's like, okay, but you know, how much time is that going to take, and are we staffed appropriately for it? And let's take a look at our Gantt chart and see where this might all fit. And these are terribly self-destructive activities for the creative director, because the creative director is supposed to have that, that bold, almost unachievable idea. And the rest of the team is supposed to be pulling the director back. Uh, and the director needs to be resisting it. And that's kind of my, my image for how the great stuff gets made. Uh, do, do you have people who are kind of trying to pull you back from the cliff edge? Or do you do that yourself? Are you, are you looking at your ideas and saying, well, yeah, but we only have three months to ship it. So let's get this. Well, fortunately, I'm, 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 I'm in a position now where I don't have to like, you know, the, the kind of deadlines I used to face when I was younger are different now. You know, there's, I built up a little trust with, you know, take two and they, they sort of give me a little more leeway, but I think that I, I do worry about dates and I do worry about times because I do believe it's important that the game is, well, A, if you get an infinite amount of time, infinite amount of time and money, I think it's, that could be a real problem for a creative director because that creates a kind of paralysis. So you want to have milestones you're working towards. You want to have people around you who are reminding you of these things and pointing out the trade-offs. Like I never want to have a producer who says you can't do that. What I wanted as a producer, and I have, uh, you know, Zed Waddell is our producer on this game, and Leonie Mann's hand, and, um, it, um, and um, a bunch of people under them, they'll basically tell me the butcher's bill. And I'm also responsible for the financial health of the company as the president of the company. And so I, I do wear a little bit of the producer's hat. I'm concerned about it, but I also know that if it's not great, it's not worth it. Like you can, you could, you could save a lot of money by making not great things. And then you're not going to save a lot of money. You're going to lose a lot of money and how you figure out that alchemy. That's the job, right? That's the job. And, but I don't have, I don't have the skill set of a producer, but I'm, but I'm always interested in what's expensive and what's cheap. And I always ask what's expensive and what's cheap. And, um, you know, quite often to be honest games are made in their cut passes you know that's uh, often where where the real you start getting rid of the chaff and when you have stuff that isn't working great in the game and you haven't fully finished it yet you can save yourself you can make a better game and save a lot of time by really saying what really matters in this game and what doesn't and we do that all the time we talk about things that that what can we get rid of um but yeah it, it's a, it, it's a fine it's a fine line there's i i don't think you want a creator who doesn't care about that stuff at all I think you want a creator who knows enough about it, but surround yourself with experts on, you know, what takes what to make what happen. Yeah, I guess there's a spectrum. I mean, uh, 
for every director who has to be pulled back from their team. I suspect there is somebody uh, like Todd, Todd Howard. I really doubt he's got um, producers telling him what he can or can't do on the game. And yet he manages to have the strong creative direction and chip those very large titles. I think a great creative director has to be aware of the trade-offs of, of, of time and money and all those things. Cause you know, you're, you've got people working on a product and you know, they've got their lives and you don't want to make them work for years when it's unnecessary because they could be doing something else with their career. So you, you, you have to, and yourself too, I'm, you know, I'm 53 years old. It's not like I have a thousand of these things left in me. Um, so I, I, I take it seriously, but then but again, everything I release, I, if I'm going to spend that kind of time and energy, you want to at least have a chance that it's going to be something really cool. And so just getting it out the door to, you know, is not, is not um, essential. But I do wonder, Mark, you know, we did System Shock 2 in like 14 months because we had to, you know, um, I never want to do that again, you know, but, but we did something special. And I think part of it is because we, we, we made smart choices within the limitations of, of, of what we had, which was very, very small and limited. So when you look out there, um, if, we, if we just look at sort of this, I don't know, creative vision aspect of games, who's doing work that you respect or look up to? So I've been playing, like the narrative games I've been playing a lot of, like things like Inside by Playdead. Thing, uh, things like inside. I think the only thing like inside is inside. It is inside. If you know of another, let me know. I'll be playing. Well, that well they have again. a previous. They have a previous game. I don't know if you played that. And it's yes, sort of. It's good. It's but it's obviously. I think they were building up to inside. Um, and that is a game. The reason I love it so much is obviously there's not a single word in the whole thing. Yet there's and there's not a specific story that you know exactly what's happening. They really play. I kind of like things that leave a lot up to the user to figure out. And, you know, every choice they made was a choice, the limited color palette, you know, this, this style of, 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 you know, highly, highly polarized visual images, um, the, and the completely bizarre ending that you can't really understand. And maybe you're not supposed to understand. I understand it. And you're now a multi-limbed monster and it's a, it's a good thing. <laughs> But but it, but it, it, it take a break. Just it, it, a it, it doesn't sort of fit into the standard. Like if you have pitched out in a you know in a, to a, to a, you know to a studio executive, Warner Brothers, they laugh you out of the room. But in the game, uh, it just sort of left me with this strange, bizarre feeling, and I walked away just loving the experience because it's doing something that I've never seen in another medium. There's no other medium that makes it that made could make that experience. Um, well. Now that we're talking about inside, I mean, I want to know if the pitch, the first pitch for that involved the ending, or if the ending is something happened when the team, you know, had had the world and all that and said, okay, now where do we take this? Do you imagine maybe it was, I mean, I don't know what happened. Maybe the creative director came in, he spent the weekend, you know, on some kind of retreat and came and said, all right, guys, here's how the game's going to end. Yeah, yeah. Here's, the ball. Start. here's the start. You're being chased by police. Here's the end. I think you're in like a terrarium, right? And, and, and uh, you, know. you can imagine the people on the team being like, dude, WTF. And he, you know, or maybe they loved it. I don't know. But, no, you know I, I, I can totally match. It's like, cool, let's do it. Though they, not, they, not having any narrative, I mean, that's tough. Um, what has a narrative, Mark? It's just, it's just not. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Having only environmental narrative, having no words spoken, that's tough. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it's so limited. It's so limited. Like you say, it's got a very, as you said, no spoken words, very limited narrative, very limited color. Limitations are everything in that game. All you're doing, the entire game is moving from left to right. How do I get to the right? That's the entire game. There's no instructions. There's no... Um, the rule set, the scenarios, and it, it sort of, you know, and it has, it, it has precedence. It really, out of this world, you know, is a game that I think from way back in the day is a game that was very similar in a lot of ways that had a lot of the same kind of mystery um, to it. I, I just, I just, I, I, I love that game and I love playing, um, I'm playing a ton of small indie roguelikes, you know, Into the Breach and Dead Cells and um, because they introduce a whole new type of game loop 
that well, they, not just those games. Those you know they 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 inherited stuff from Rogue, you know, back in the day, and sort of build upon it. A game loop that's quite not chronological, you know, in this way we expect game loops to be, you know, beginning, middle, and end of the story. You keep going, returning back to the beginning, and I I find that experimentation really really great. So I've been excited. I I, I think it's been a great a great few year for for games. Um, and you know the, the AAA guys still continue to make really amazing and fresh products at Corey, Corey, and you know, and I love what I love about Corey, like the God of War thing you said was so great about it is the story was so simple, right? We have to bring your mother to the top of that mountain, right? And so the motivation was you didn't take 20 minute cutscene to explain that. It was just a very human, very gettable. There's no evil warlord. There was none of that. And it all came up, all kinds of crazy stuff came up. But it was such a human story. And I think that was great. They were really getting down to these basic human stories and then a story about fatherhood on top of that versus the complexities of the wars of the gods. And that can all exist. But the rubric of, of very human, simple stories, I think we're really starting to, to, to catch on to. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. It also managed to take the player to a lot of interesting places. Yeah. So, um, we talked a little bit about Inside, which is purely environmental narrative. Um, taking a look at, at, at your works for a moment is you've got heavy environmental narrative, but you've also got, well, people speak, right? There's cutscenes. Um, where do you think the, the bulk of the, I don't know, world feel or what's making it special is coming from? You get a lot out of out of the, you know, people speak. You know, you can take the player to a museum, right? You want to tell some backstory, you can just tell some backstory. Uh, there's there's no restrictions there. I mean, is there is there a a a part on this that you're leaning into more? I think you know, environment. We, the reason we started doing environmental narrative like back, you know, at System Shock Two, was because. Uh, it seemed like a missing opportunity, a very high resolution opportunity compared to audio, you know, dialogue and, and characters talking to each other to convey information. And the player can, can get that information while still playing, right? They don't need to stop, put their controller down and watch a cutscene. So I saw the power in it, um, you know, very early on and was really drawn to it, mostly because it could expand the amount of story you could tell without expanding the amount of I don't like making players wait around. Um, I try to respect their time. And um, so environment was, was a, you know, a, a huge place for that. And as obviously the rendering tools got more sophisticated, you know, the environmental storytelling in System Shock 2 is pretty rinky-dink because we just had such limited, you know, um, technology capabilities. And by the time we got to Bioshock, I think you had a world that you could make much more believable and therefore move a lot of the storytelling to the world. Cause I just want to keep the player going, going, going. I want to respect their time. I want to, um, but I also don't want to put things in front of them. Cause I think if they find something versus having it put in their face, they're going to feel a lot more ownership over that moment than they would if they, if we told them like, sit back, eat your popcorn and watch this for 20 minutes. And that works. Like I'm not, I'm, I love all forms of games. I love all the different, I love that. I don't think I'm always the guy who says more art, the better. Um, but for me, I like kind of, I make games for the kinds of experiences I like to play and I don't like waiting around to watch long story scenes. So I just thought that was a great opportunity to do that while keeping the player engaged and active. Yeah, that makes, I mean, it makes total sense. If the, if the player has freedom, then the player can dig in further and learn more or not. Uh, it's an interactive media. After all, uh, are there any kinds of um, themes or topics you're trying to address? Is there a, a message? I mean, I look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia says that uh, Bioshock Infinite is uh, about American exceptionalism. How, how do you feel when you hear your work boiled down to two words like that? Well, it, it's funny. You probably have this experience. Games are now at the point where there people are writing academic papers about them. And so I've spread a few of the academic papers on the work we've done. And it's always interesting because it gives you a new sense of the kind of, you know, remember being in college and you take a class on like James Joyce or something and they'd say, well, what Joyce meant here was this or that, right? And usually the academic analysis 
either I don't remember it very well, or it's really, really often gives me a lot more credit for my thought process than I actually have. You know, they'll not analyze all the names of the characters and say, Levine was, was obviously influenced by the blah, 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 some book I never read. Um, obviously. And, what? Obviously. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but I think that's okay because there's a whole... There's a whole field of analysis, and I, I strongly believe that the experience of the user in their game is that experience. Like, I'm not the author making something that's uh, rigid, because I think that when people love the games and they come to you and they tell you how much they love the games, you realize almost always it's not just the game. There is something in their life that being that is sort of slotted in, and those two things made an alchemy together. They're going through a breakup or they just got into college, or they were living alone for the first time. And this thing provided some kind of mirror for their own life in a way. And so when most people come to talk to me about the game, I just listen to them and listen to their experience. And when people ask me what things meant in the game, I always say, well, what do you think it meant? Because I kind of don't matter. One day I'm gonna be gone. And if, you know, if I'm fortunate enough that people are still playing the work, I'm not going to be there to say like what I meant. And frankly, I may not even remember. It was a long time ago. And, you know, I barely remember what happened yesterday. So I, I really, I kind of don't, uh, people are going to interpret all kinds of things from the game. And I think that's great because that's what makes the gaming experience. It, it's, it's an alchemy of the player and the game. It's not just, the game doesn't stand as a monolith unto itself. Um, so, so I, but it's interesting to read people's analysis because sometimes I'm like, wow, that makes me sound a lot smarter than I actually am and a lot better read than I actually am. It's an interesting choice not to talk about it. Of course, the other choice is to talk about it, which some creators do. Oh, um, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I wish it's fine. Um, I don't know. It's a little less fun for the people who are playing it and analyzing it though, I guess. Yeah. People write to me and they'll say like, you know, at the end of infinite, did Booker, was that Anna in the crib or was that, and, and I never want to answer that question because well, there's no fun in that, right? Because then it's, and they ask yeah. me about what's canon, you know, what's, this is canon, is that canon, you know, other works that people made that I wasn't involved with. And I don't really like to answer that question, except that I can say that, well, I've got my own canon in my head and that may or may not fit in it, but that's not, that doesn't have to be your canon. Your canon can be whatever you want it to be. Yeah, well, there's also, you know, sometimes you're deliberately, at the ending, I think, deliberately to some degree, not wrapping it all up um, cleanly. It'd be kind of like asking a uh, you know, director of Inception, okay, at the end, is is he in a is he in a dream or the real world? Right, right, with, with the top spinning? Yeah, with the top spinning, it, it kind of the point is, well, you know, you, you've got to come to your own conclusion there. I th isn't that more fun? I think that's more fun, you know, and I think that th that's more honest and more fun because, yeah, Christopher Nolan may have an answer to that, but that kind of, the question is what's fun about it, right? We like to have, that's all we're doing with, with games, right? We're, we're making, asking questions and getting people excited about finding those answers. And then sometimes we answer things definitively, like, you know, I can, they can, people ask me, you know, like, oh, is Booker Elizabeth's daughter? You know, I say, yeah, because that's pretty well established in the, in the canon. But then, you know, what happened in this scene where we left a lot of things open? That's really up to the player. I think we were trying to make an emotion to feel the feeling of possibility. And that's what the future is, right? The future is possibility. It's not, it's not determined. And I like leaving those possibilities open and let people fill in the blanks themselves. I have a lot of, I have fans who are, very, very, very concerned about the fate of certain of these characters and what happened to them. Like very concerned. And um, and I just have to tell them, you know, whatever you think you want, whatever makes you happiest, just do that, you know? Because I'm not here to tell you some fictional thing that's gonna make you sad. Like that, that doesn't serve anybody's purpose. The thing he's here to create, to spark conversation and to create joy. Um, I don't want to take that away from anybody. Well, maybe they just want a happy ending. And uh, I guess there's not going to be a sequel. Or is there? You're going back uh, to that universe? I'm not. I think they've announced that there's going to be, but I'm, I'm working on my own. I'm working on my own thing. I think I had sort of said what I wanted to say about it. So I wanted to do something a little different. 
All right, well, before we uh, wrap things up here, one last question. Um, what keeps you going in games? I don't kind know. Kind of an open question. I think that, I, I think it's mostly it's an escape. For, so as you know, games are a lot of work and they're, sometimes you go home and you're just like, why am I doing this, right? It's just too hard. But sometimes when I'm sad or depressed or whatever, I go into a world that I completely control, which is the, you know, the fictional game world here. And it gives you a sense when you're feeling powerless or useless or incompetent or not able to deal with the problems in your life. Well, I can go here. And when I go there, sometimes I go, I'm just there. And sometimes I step out of it. I'm like, whoa, where was I? And there's nothing like that. It's a meditative, it's a meditative practice and you leave your body and it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to get in that state, but I, 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 I love that. I feel like I, I have friends who are, you know, Elizabeth and Booker and, you know, and J Sandra Cohen and the people I know, I feel like I kind of know them. And I, I like that, you know, when I see somebody with that tattoo, you know, some people have these Bioshock one tattoos on their arm with the chains and stuff. And I think that you can have an impact on other people. Cause I know how much the art that I've loved in my life has an impact on me and how much, cause we talk about escape. Art is also a huge escape. Other people's art is a huge escape for me. Life is hard. Life is painful. And to be able to give yourself that escape and to give other people that escape, I think is a, is a gift. And I'm grateful to have gotten a little bit, a little, a little, a little spark of that um, because it gives me a place to go. Wow. Well, that's a, a great answer to a not particularly great question. So uh, thank you very much, Ken. And thank you. Uh, thank you for making time for this conversation. I really appreciate it, man. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so, so much, Ken and Mark. It's been a very special moment for, for us, for Game Lab and for all the community watching the event today. Amazing talk, amazing thoughts. Um, that last thought of Ken, I think it makes a lot of sense in this particular time. And I think the, this industry has does magic, right? We can, we can change the world in a way and people like you are, are changing it. So uh, keep on going. It's been an enormous privilege to see you talking for the first time, I think, ever here at Game Lab. I will never forget this, forget this. And hopefully see you, see you soon. See you soon in Barcelona or somewhere in the world, in a safe world. Thank, thank thanks, you so much. Thank you. Thank you for providing it. Mark, those are some actually, I think, those led to some really interesting conversations. So thank you for those questions. They were, they, re they really, uh, they really, they really allow, they, they were very easy to tune into and, and, and generate some original thought on. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Yvonne. Hope to thank see you, you in Mark. Barcelona see you soon. soon.